They help us to explore. They connect us. They provide us with a home between here and there. Today, this freedom is being challenged. Increasing congestion and the demands of the modern world leave us feeling trapped and frustrated by the time we've lost. At Volvo, we believe autonomous driving will recapture this freedom. By providing people with a choice to drive or delegate driving to the car, we give them control of their time and open a new world of possibilities. The freedom to choose how every moment in the car is spent. opportunities of enhancing your quality of life. Well, the challenges are immense. Um, it's not only about supervising, it's actually about creating a system that must handle all possible situations and take care of it. And not take care of it once or twice, but always deliver the correct action in the car. And this is a technical challenge which is immense. So we have to deliver a foolproof system. And basically, normally technology is not foolproof. But we have to take this extra stretch and we have to think differently when we design this technology. Because otherwise, it will not be foolproof. And I will go through some of the elements and the challenges we are going to reach. Well, it all started quite some years back. Because already in 2008, uh, Volvo Car Corporation made a very bold statement. We said that no one should be killed or seriously injured in a new Volvo car by 2020. That was a very bold statement. Because when that was said, there was no technology in the world available to deliver this kind of statement. But what it really did for us was that we collectively started to organize ourselves, both in terms of our strategic thinking, but also how we defined our cars, but also how we developed our systems, both in terms of hardware and software, to create a platform, create the technology which was necessary in order to build the active safety systems that we have in our cars of today. So this strategy was driving technology race within the corporation and we had connected very quickly with some strategic suppliers but a huge amount of internal knowledge has been created within Volvo. And this is also what you can experience in our cars with pilot assist and other kind of features which are there and which we are pretty unique of. So basically our vision or dream does not stop at 2020. We also believe that autonomous driving will continue to deliver on this promise and will make a basic, a very, very big stamp or footprint in the automotive market of again creating safety and security for people in the traffic environment. Because one good thing with, with autonomous drive is that a car driving autonomous will never fall asleep. An autonomous drive car will not divert from the road but because you're texting an SM text message. So there's a lot of things which is very, very important and which we have to begin here. So we believe that with autonomous drive and the next step we're going to take, we will be creating the safest car ever. And for Volvo, that's quite something special. So Volvo 
and always core about people and safety. <coughs> we talked about the technology development. I will just give you some examples what needs to be there in order to actually deliver on the minimum of autonomous drive technology. First of, the, first of all, you must have good cameras. And they should only not have a near focus or mid focus or long term focus. They must also be able to read and understand and see in the dark. It must also be able to change very quickly from a dark environment to a light environment. I mean, if this is when you go out on a tunnel or you do the other way around. On top of that, it must be sharp should not be affected by rain, and it should be on top of that redundant. Because all the sensors <coughs> must be redundant. On top of that, we must have radars in the car. And the radars will read distances to other vehicles, but also when it comes to bikes or when it comes to motorcycles. And you have a very special situation in Kuala Lumpur with all your bikes running between the lanes, which is not predicted by legislation. Uh, but this will cause some extra testing, I can tell you. This is not understood. This radar system must have a 360 degree view in order to understand where the car is and how it relates to other vehicles or objects. And at low speeds, you will also have uh, ultrasonic sensors between 10 and 12 that will read the close environment, the proximity of the car. You also need lasers, and the lasers will scan on a longer distance and combine what the radar is seeing later on and put the picture together, and then check with the camera. On top of that, you must have an extraordinary detailed mapping and this mapping is a 3D mapping in combination with an ultra-ordinary, precise GPS system that positions your car also on the mapping on 3D. But that is not enough. On top of that, you need to be connected into the cloud. Because maybe this morning, the, the, uh, the guys with the jello overalls started to dig in the road. And that means that that map must be updated automatically and in real time. So cloud is also extremely important for the, the possibility of this system. And when we talk about the cloud, we're not talking about the 3G or 4G. That will not be enough. Because the amount of data that must be transferred must be much higher level. And then we talk about 5G. And that is why we later on have uh, Ericsson on the podium. So if you look at the cloud, the cloud in itself will communicate, but there must also be some specific services delivered by the cloud. There will be a Volvo environment where we deliver a number of services which is necessary, but it could also be third party uh, suppliers giving us the weather data, uh, traffic uh, environment data, repair data, roads or blocks or whatever there is, all these things must be combined and fed into the car and into the system. So the system can take the right decisions. There are definitions of autonomous drive and this has been defined by, by SAE, which is a standardization organization in the world. And there are five levels of autonomous drive or driver assist. And the first two ones basically are different levels of support to you as a driver. And for instance, all our cars, many of our cars in the new spa platform is delivering on level two, which means that we will automatically accelerate, brake, and steer. But you are always responsible and in command. So you must be the supervisor. Then when you move over to level four and five, there is a shift which I'll come to a bit later on. But here, the car takes the command and takes the responsibility of what happened. And you should be able to pull back from the active role. 
There will be coincidences. For instance, when the system is not working anymore, where there are things happening on the road which is not predicted, where the car will ask you to come back and take control. If you don't do that in certain parameters, then the car will do something on the road. Hope it go to the right and break down and slow down. So you are able to understand what's going on. All these things has to be, of course, including the algorithms later on, which is not easy. There is one position I don't mention, and that is the level three. And level three is actually one of our competitors are saying that they have level three, and in reality, they have. But the problem here is that it's somewhere in between. So sometimes the driver has to take the control and sometimes you rely upon that the, the car will take control. This will cause a kind of a legal complication. Because for us, we have decided that when it comes to liability, we are responsible when the cars are equipped on level four and five. This is a statement made by Hawkins Sonnes on 2015 in Washington. And he was the first one who said that yes, we take responsibility of our technology. Yes, we will deliver technology that actually will deliver according to customer expectations. And yes, we will take the legal responsibility for what's happening. This is actually, of course, pushing us on the technology side very tough because we have to deliver on this for sure. So what do we need to have in the cars? And how do we design it? Well, first of all, you see two horizontal lines there. And what it actually tells you is that there are two sets of computers which are supporting each other and checking each other. And that is creating the first level of redundancy. But the most important thing is that all the sensors are what they are, they are detecting must be interpreted. And that must be interpreted maybe 30 times per second. It must be interpreted when it's light outside, when it's sunny outside, when it's dusk outside, and when it's dark outside. It has to be interpreted. It has to be interpreted absolutely correctly. If one of the sensors fails, then that must also be detected and fed into the system and you pull in a number of redundant functions, meaning that you're warning the driver, you slow down the car, you do maneuvers with the car. All these things have to be understood and predicted and taken care of. But what you see, the perception, meaning what is out there, you also have to take a lot of decisions. Not only once per second, but 30 times per second, you have to take a decision on where to go. Should I brake? Should I accelerate? Should I avoid? Should I go right? Should I go left? What does the map tell me? Is there a roadblock ahead of me? What's going on? All these things, all these decisions must be done. On top of that, you have to take actions. You have to decide what the car must do. And when you decide that, it has to do the right things. And also here, we must have redundant functions that steps in if there is an unlogical sequence of activities happening, which should not be there. So it's very interesting that it's not only the things that should be correct, you must also have fallback scenarios on everything that can go wrong. Because if you don't do that, then you probably will fail later on. So you can imagine how much software development that is developed. And secondly, you might, can also imagine how much processor power you need in the car in order to do with this. <coughs> so, in order to get this one, all these things happening, we have formed a number of projects where we interact and we work together with different kind of companies in order to mobilize the best brains and the best technicians and the best people understanding people in the world. And those three different projects are, are related to hardware, and one's related to software, and one's related to the people 
human interaction in how should the car operate and work together with the car in a, in a logical way. The first collaboration is actually together with Uber. And uh, Volvo and Uber will put in about 300 million US dollars in order to further develop the hardware uh, structure. And we talk about refined sensors, uh, we talk about the redundancy issue on the hardware side, but we will also develop some specific systems for, for Uber, which means that they can operate a self-driving taxis or cabs. Because in the end, if you order an Uber car and another guy comes in, uh, then of course someone has paid for it already, right? <laughs> on the other side, the biggest surprise, you never know where to go. <laughs> but in the end, it's, it's very, very complicated in that sense. Today, more than 100 XC90s are driving in San Francisco and Pittsburgh, in the United States, and they are validating technology like this. The second uh, collaboration is uh, the merger uh, of competences between Autoliv and the uh, Volvo Car Corporation. So we formed a, a shared company called Senuiti, and this company, uh, all the IT which we had on Volvo and all the IT which we were at, at Autoliv were put together in this company. And today, 600 guys are working now with, with the software development for Volvo. And as a spin off, we think that this competence and this product and these possibilities are so unique and so strong that also third party uh, car manufacturers can buy this from us. So it will be a separate product which we call autonomous drive. So if Proto wants to buy it, they probably have to pay a bit for it, right? The third one is really how does it work together with human people, meaning that how do I relate to the autonomous drive? What is good? What kind of interaction points do we need to refine and improve in order for the people to, to really like it and really desire to use it? And these are the things that we need to, to, to understand and dig deeper, so because the human-centric perspective is very, very important for us. So I will show you a small film about this project, so let's see. With rapidly growing urban populations across the globe, fluid and sustainable mobility is no longer a desire. It has become a necessity. The Drive Me project brings together academia and the private and public sectors in a unique research venture designed to understand the opportunities and benefits that autonomous driving can bring to society and to the individual. Autonomous driving, I think, will be the key solution to uh, transport systems' main challenges that we have today. Environmental challenges, health challenges, safety and capacity. Understanding the complexities of the societal, industrial and legal landscape is vital if we're to make autonomous cars a reality. This is the aim of the Drive Me project. Autonomous cars offer us an opportunity to reduce both pollution and congestion in our cities, an area that town planners and local governments are taking very seriously. Academia plays a vital role in ensuring that these needs are taken into consideration and new ideas are researched and put into practice. Volvo, who is a leader in the development of advanced driver assistance systems, is well on its way to delivering unsupervised autonomous cars to customers by 2020. In fact, it is already testing autonomous cars on public roads in Sweden. The technology is maturing quickly. Traffic laws and legislation that enable testing on public roads and ultimately the sale of autonomous cars to real customers need to be in place by early 2020. Today, the US and the EU are struggling to create a coherent legislative approach to autonomous driving. 